Hello, and welcome to the Commonweal Policy Podcast. I'm Craig DL, I'm the Head of Policy and Research at Commonweal, and this week I am joined once again by Ellen DL, Human Rights Campaigner, Creative Director for EU Citizens for an Independent Scotland, and my lovely wife. <laughs> Hello, Ellen, how are you? Hi, I'm good. <laughs> so, this week uh, represents a kind of continuation of a few of your um, visits to this this podcast. Way back in episode ten and episode thirteen, we were talking about the the referendums bill in Scotland and the electoral franchise bill, which are now acts, which are now in Scots law, and which have extended the the right to vote in Scotland to everybody resident in Scotland, regardless of citizenship. Scotland now has one of the most expansive voting franchises in the world, and um, it's been really exciting to see that that progress through and, ha- and have all the complaints and um, concerns we've had through that process but see them slowly resolved and that is now law um but this has has now led to the the next phase of that campaigning and the implications of this new expansive uh, franchise on on what happens to Scotland's elections we've seen the impact now in the in the May elections um uh, of of a huge tranche of new voters come into uh, Scottish politics for the first time um but we're now looking forward to possibly the next big uh, democratic exercise nationally in Scotland which may well be another independence referendum I'm not going to make a statement about the face that I just pulled. <laughs> um, yeah, it might be. I mean, the franchise has changed quite significantly um, and it is one of the most inclusive, though we still are deciding to exclude asylum seekers um, with a really strange explanation about yeah. that um, because it, it, at the time it, it evolved or surrounded the idea of uh, it needs to be a concrete status, but actually being an asylum se- seeker is a status by... By anyone's account, yeah. um, so that was a, a bit of a strange surprise, but um, yeah, I've already been on the podcast since, and the last time we discussed independence polling and polling about pol- politics in general, um, and how there is very few numbers available for specifically polling of um, new Scots of all sorts, whether that's English, well, the the English born new Scots are slightly different um, because the polls tend to break down into Scottish, English and others and others lumps everybody else who is a new Scot together um, but yeah that one particularly confuses me I, I would have expected if we were going to break down new Scots at all in the, in the polling you would see rest of UK and other but as it stands this other group includes EU citizens non-EU citizens plus anyone who was born in Wales or Ireland yeah so it is a strange one um yeah we, we talked about this in a, in the last podcast you were on a few weeks ago um and in which we talked about one of your articles um for, for Commonweal when you were talking about the, the difficulties in campaigning towards New Scots because of this lack of data, um, including your, this was one of the, the big surprises for me as you were going through that, is, is if we were to try and do a dedicated poll on New Scots, just the co- sheer cost involved in doing that. Yeah, we're talking tens of thousands rather than a couple of thousand. Yeah, so it's well out of the reach of interested individuals we've seen plenty of interested individuals in scotland commission their own polls of the general scottish population it's out of the reach of think tanks like commonweal if if folk want to do this kind of thing you're really looking at government level resources to do it um so it's, it's very expensive very difficult but that lack of data has led to misconceptions about the 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 attitudes of new scots towards things like scottish independence and that's really kind of the focus on what we're talking about the podcast this week. Yeah, I just realised there that if we were to change something about this, it would be even more granular descriptions rather than having just those three categories because while it might be expensive, at the minute the the number that is being given by am- amalgamating all the, these new Scots is not one that represents any specific group ad- yeah. adequately or properly so we might end up with smaller samples but at least there will be a consistent sample that is broken down into a more logical you know basis yeah so yeah I mean, that does e- even just lumping together eu scots and non uh, non-eu scots for instance it, it, it really makes it difficult to even just find out what has been the impact of brexit 
on attitudes of, of new Scots in Scotland. Yeah. Um, and by the way, congratulations on finally achieving your settled status. We just found out today that uh, you have had your status confirmed. Yeah, let's go and buy a new couple of rolls of toilet paper or whatever to celebrate. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not something that really should be congratulated or celebrated. Regaining some of your rights, is it? Well, after after all these years of worrying about it, I can tell you that it is a relief to have it. Um, but I am getting grumpier the longer I think about it, so I think we'd better move on. <laughs> yes, let's move on. And let's move into uh, the article that uh, that you proposed writing for, for Commonweal that really kind of kicked off a, a whole series of, of, of events, including our latest policy paper. Yeah, so on the note of grumpy, I guess, um, <laughs> one of the side effects of policy changing and Scotland having a new um, electoral franchise bill come into force in 2019 was obviously that there was going to be some pushback. And the pushback was not exclusively that of the Tories, who didn't want anybody to have voting rights anyway. Yeah. Silly human rights. None of those, please. Um, It actually came uh, into the independence movement as well. And suddenly there's there was rumour starting around um, that the electoral franchise bill needed to be changed again and that um, giving new Scots voting rights was a huge mistake and so on and so forth. And the longer I, I w- walked for life hearing these arguments made on the independence side, the more after the... The grumpiness subsides, you kind of still are left there and are going, well, where, where's your data? Oh, in 2014, New Scots voted this and that way. Actually, we have very little data on 2014. Mm. Um, but aside from that, that is now seven years ago and we have a lot of data available since then. So why is nobody looking at that? So with that idea, I came um, grumping at my husband and <laughs> saying, could you, I know you've got this wonderful spreadsheet where you... Uh, track all the progress on independence polling and have been for years can we have a look at this yeah and this was this was something that I, I had done in 2017 and 2018 we have two papers there called the demographics of independence where i was tracking these polls people when these polls come out tend to look at just that headline number what is overall independence support like in scotland if you go a little bit deeper you might compare that one number to the previous poll and you might see a little bit of trend work there. What you almost never see is people diving in below that to find out how different groups are moving around. Um, and it's hard to do. The, the, the polls are kind of sketchy. They come out irregularly. Often they're asking slightly different questions across different polls. So you might get one poll that only asks people aged 18 plus in Scotland, despite the voting age being 16. Very few polls ask about income. Very few polls ask about where someone was born. Um, so it can be difficult to pull that data out, but it's something that we have tried to do. And it's something that I hadn't really looked at since 2018 for a variety of reasons. And I had been occasionally grumping at you saying, I should pick this up. I should have another look at it. And we finally actually did it and we were surprised by what we found. Yeah. I mean, before we go forward with any further explanation, like it's important to say that According to the European Charter of Human Rights, if somebody holds a certain democratic right, like was the case with EU citizens and the voting rights that they had within Scotland before Brexit that got taken away through Brexit and needed to be reinstated after Brexit. Um, So if if that's the case, then that represents a human rights violation. So any talk of changing the electoral franchise to remove democratic rights from a group that currently holds them is kind of a total no-go. Yeah. So from that perspective, I guess it's not an argument, but it's it's so easy to say that. And I think it, it, it's necessary to back that up with data. And the data that we found was quite surprising. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is worth emphasizing that. In the previous podcasts where we talked about this, we talked about our kind of sense of dismay at watching conservative MSPs saying that this group of people should not be given the right to vote and that is you know pretty horrible pretty horrible to think thing to say as it is but to go further than that to say this group of people who have the right to vote should have that right stripped from them is a different level of human rights violation altogether it really is worth considering that if we if folk are wanting to change the franchise in a way that shrinks the franchise 
it turns out that won't even be necessary yeah. because this is a bullshit argument. I'm sorry for cursing on this podcast, but it is a bullshit argument. Um, it turns out that especially all the, for all the criticism that we're hearing of English New Scots, their support for independence since 2014 has gone up by 11.3% yeah. overall. That doesn't mean that more than 50% of them are now voting for independence or whatever. It just means that their pro- percentage of support has increased by 11.3%. And if the rest of the population of Scotland increased their support by the same amount, we'd actually be well over 60% support for independence at this point. Yeah, and it, yeah, it, and it's especially been a, a rise that's happened since 2018. I, I go into a little bit of this in the demographics paper. We'll talk about that a bit later. Um, but it has been a consistent rise. It hasn't sort of gone up and fallen down, gone up, fallen down. It has been a consistent push upwards. Yeah, and a slow one, a slow, steady yeah. incline in pro-independence sentiment among the English New Scot population. Now, before I wrote this article, I approached quite a few different organisations from Scotia to uh, English Scots for Yes and said, guys, wh- why are you not counteracting these arguments i think we should have a conversation and none of them actually got back to me which was interesting i think it it was such a difficult topic for some to talk about about integration about you know what it means to feel excluded and how it feels to be attacked for your nationality um in the context of a political situation you care a great deal about that people just didn't really want to look behind it and it shouldn't really take a new Scot, neither me nor an English new Scot, to do this. So I think, um, as difficult as it was for you at the time, it was kind of a point of realization that um, we have been kind of s- asleep when it comes to demographics, not just Commonweal to a degree, because you've updated that paper several times in the last couple of years, but the entire movement has stopped actually looking at what is happening in the publicly available figures. Yeah, I mean, I have reasons, if they're not excuses, that I was doing other things. I was looking at other other policies. Um, Commonweal is busy, but that data was there, and, and even I just wasn't looking at it. This is public domain data. No one had any excuse for not being able to access it. And what actually brought up part of this discussion about writing me writing this article was uh, about Ian Blackford being very... Um, victorious about the unionists having to reveal their unionist poll data. Um, yeah, let's talk about a bit about this, actually. That's a good aside. This is the story that Michael Gove and the union unit in the UK had been commissioning polls on attitudes in Scotland towards independence and towards the union, but they had hidden the data. They, they weren't publishing it. Now, in, in um, UK polling rules, you can do that. You can you can commission a poll and and just keep it hidden and not publish the data. You can use it internally. Um, although if you publish anything from it, you have to publish all of it. So um, it, it, it is an all or nothing. And they had chosen in this case to not publish anything. And yeah, the the, the SNP MP group had been had had caught wind that this had been happening and were pressuring the the UK government to publish the polls. Um, I think it went to court and they won. Yeah, but, yeah, but I think it went via FOI. They had FOI'd them for the results and they refused to, to publish them. They went to court to, to compel them to publish the FOI, which that, that court case has won. So the data's still not out. I'm not quite sure what the current state of that but is. But there was a lot of, of noise about there it. There was a lot of noise, I started yes. getting a bit suspicious about this because um, while, you know... It, this is a poll, and yes, there there's data there, and it's being kept secret, but is it really a story that needs to come out over several weeks every time again yeah. with the same people as the figurehead it's shouting blue murder? So I decided that I would FOI the Scottish government, and I asked them. <laughs> yeah. I asked them um, to provide me with any and all polling in regards to independence that they commissioned since January 2018. Um, including any resulting data tables. Yeah, because the the rationale for this is if your opponent is commissioning polls um, and you want to 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 see them, then there's cu- a couple of possibilities. Yeah. Either, and this would be the the proactive campaigning possibility, 
you are also commissioning calls on roughly the same things at roughly the same time and you essentially want to check your working if you're both coming up with the same answers. Well, that's a very optimistic thing. But... Yeah, very optimistic. But that, that is that is how I would approach this kind of thing. You want to see if they're finding the same things as you are or if they are different, you then want to find out why they are different. Why is the UK government finding attitudes on the union that are wildly different from the Scottish, what the right. Scottish government is? How does it compare to our data set? Yes. The other explanation is what we actually found. Yeah, I got a I got a reply from about my FOI, and it stated that there had been absolutely no independence polls and attitudes on the union polls conducted um, that had been commissioned by the Scottish government since January twenty eighteen, um, which was not the news that we the one no. that I had wanted to hear. But uh, it wasn't a great news story either way. It seems a bit of a waste of time. It still sticks in the back of my mind because I think you know. If we're really seriously talking about independence and have been in the last three years, how come that there is no independence polling being conducted by yeah. the government of the country seeking independence? But this is not a new trend. It was just an aside. I think that was interesting because it showed an interest in polling. Um, it turned out that the polling data that the Scottish government, or at least Ian Blackford, was looking for for as SNP um, to shame the Tories and, and this they, who was it? Michael Gove. Uh, Michael Gove uh, his unit um, That that is one thing, but we are still able to look at data that is already out there, you yeah. know, we don't need to FYI polling like that so once that came back and we heard okay um there has been no polling conducted we had to look at the data that was available to us because i i don't think it, it is right to uh, leave an argument like removing voting rights from people unchecked yeah. in favor of independence and then we find out that not only have english scots um made massive progress over the last seven years and not only do we find out that if everybody had made the same progress as English Scots, we'd be over the 60% mark and could sustain it at this point. But the reality is also that actual native Scots, people born in Scotland, have fallen in their support, especially in the last couple of years, for independence. And that is a worrying story that is being completely ignored over this hubbub about removing voting rights from new Scots. Yeah, so if we if we look at the polling data across 2021, sort of an average across 2021 so far, um, and compare that to the data across 2014, just after IndyRef, then English-born New Scots have increased their support by 11.3%, as you mentioned. Uh, New Scots born out with England, so that's your EU, non-EU, plus your Welsh and your Irish, and that... that, that Massive stew of, of, of new Scots. Yeah. Um, they've increased their support by... 17.7%. 17.7%. Native-born Scots have reduced their support for Scottish independence by 1.7%. Yeah. And, of course, they make up a much larger proportion of the population than the other two combined. So that small drop in percentage terms... In, uh, from native-born Scots actually translates to a much larger number of, of actual votes. So that is the reason why you have seen the overall support for independence drop from the start of 2020 to where we are now. We had that big surge in support over um, from 2018 up until the, the end of 2020, and we've lost almost half of that gain. And it's pretty much all down to native-born Scots turning away from, from independence. Not not um, new Scots. Um, that was one of the big findings that 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 came out of the the demographics of independence paper. This twenty twenty one update. We also looked at various other categories, like what's going on with various age groups, um, both in in both males and females, and we found that there is that that general trend of older people generally being more averse to independence is still there however um the there is a big generation gap growing in female groups the the three age groups in females have all increased their support even the older females have increased their support for independence over the last several years but younger females are increasing it much faster than older females and that generation gap is is widening however Amongst 
uh, young females under 35, especially in 2021, there was a massive fall off in support. It'd be really interesting to find out the reasons for that. And that's something that we, that we can't really do with this polling data. It's something I've, I've, I've been very careful to say in that paper is I'm, I'm only looking at the numbers here and not looking at the reasons. We need those reasons. We need to, to see more uh, qualitative data, that, that kind of focus group level, survey level, door-to-door -door canvassing level data that you would get that we're not getting because we don't have that kind of organised campaign around us. Well, yes, and this this paper to me looks like in the same way that my article was intended to be a sort of flagging up of issues that need yeah. to be looked at. Because if we're if we're still talking about New Scots ruining the vote for independence, and if we keep the same franchise that we had as we had in twenty fourteen, then we're never gaining independence. <laughs> <laughs> we love our cats and other pets on this show. That was our latest addition to our family. That was Squinty, our our stray. Uh, our stray who has moved in. He likes to scream at us. Yeah. Aye, so if that's what we're still talking about, um, then we're missing the point and the opportunity to achieve the best possible result for the next independence campaign. Yeah, yeah it really must be looking at the, the groups that are are maybe slipping back in their, their support for independence or are seemingly particularly susceptible to the to, to cam different campaigning messages. Uh, another big thing that we found in this paper was that there have been some people who have moved up in their support, have moved from no to yes, but have then moved back. Uh, when we look at the, the, the polling split, split down by 2014 vote, you see that most yes voters are still yes voters, especially since 2016. There was a big drop off in, in independent support amongst yes voters in 2016, primarily around the Brexit issue. Mm. A lot of people who voted yes and leave, for instance, people who wanted out of both of the UK and the EU, or perhaps, and I know people who were in this camp, their primary motivation for independence was leaving the EU. People who were told, if Scotland becomes independent, you will be chucked out of the EU and you won't get back in. Some people heard that message and went, great, yes, I'm, I'm going to vote for that. Those people now look at a campaign that says, Scotland will go back into the EU, and they're thinking, well, I don't want that. I will vote no to prevent that. Brexit has already happened. I have achieved my goal. That shows you the kind of complexity of what, what can happen with messaging at people who are you know have different priorities. Um, we have seen probably all of the gains we're going to see from a pro-EU independence campaign. All the Remain voters who were unionists in 2016 have come over to yes. All of the Leave voters who were pro-independence supporters have moved from moved to no and they're not going to move back that change has already been baked in so maybe we need to look at different messaging around that to, to look that, at different people do you sound like a lost opportunity then? i don't know if it's a lost opportunity or not because quite frankly i don't know what's going to happen with the eu campaign and I don't know what the inevitability of Scotland re-entering the EU actually will be when it comes to crunch point. I think that there have been people who perhaps looked at independence as a possible EU lifeboat. And you see this particularly in Lib Dem voters, uh, who when you know things got very Brexity and at various moments between 2016 and now, you saw a lot of people who voted Lib Dem move over to yes, then quickly move back. It is perhaps um, a good idea to look at folk like that and work out what can be done not just to move them, but more importantly, how to keep them. We've seen that in quite a few of the demographics in, in this paper. People who were quite susceptible to an external event, you know, Brexit happening, Boris Johnson saying something daft, whatever. They would move to yes, but then would drift back to no, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. What's really not happening is the independence campaign is not managing to pull, pull these people to yes and then fix them there. Well, and it sounds like it's it's no, no longer just about external events yeah. impacting the political course of the UK and Scotland. It sounds like what people really need is an actually structured campaign yes. around a white paper that has been constructed to answer questions and to lead into an independent, green, sustainable, socially just future. Um, 
that we have, you know, well-being economy, green investment. We have heard all of these terms from ScotGov individually at convenient points before, whereas the white paper, yeah. if I remember correctly, today is the day where... Uh, two years ago, Nicola Sturgeon promised a white paper that would follow up the Sustainable Growth Commission, and um, we, it's still not been published. It has not been published. It was dropped from last year's programme for government, and this year's programme for government has been delayed till next week um, because they, they wanted to see uh, what was going to happen with the, the cooperation agreement between the, the, the SNP and the, the Greens. Although, interestingly, I did see a report in the Daily Record uh, last week saying that whether or not the the deal went ahead, this year's programme for government had already been written and fixed. Uh, so I guess we'll see what next week uh, what happens next week. Just how many mentions of the Greens and uh, their their policies actually make it into that programme. Um, uh, but yeah, that's something that I think both of us will definitely be looking for in that programme is what is happening with this independence white paper. Things, okay, things maybe had to get paused because of COVID last year. Yeah, but, it didn't get mentioned last year at all. But. Yeah. But the independence unit is back up and running. It has a staff. It has Mike Russell in charge. He has a. And if I remember been... correctly, the last white paper was commissioned out. It didn't have anything yeah. to do with staff already available to Scott Gov, yeah. whether civil servants or you know Scott Gov. Yeah, I mean, there's, 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 there's actually no reason why this has to happen within the Scottish government. Yes, Scotland was founded for a reason, and it did a lot of this kind of polling and research back in back in the 2014 campaign. What happened with Yes Scotland again? <laughs> That's a topic for another podcast. So, um, yeah, I, I would I'd highly encourage people to 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 read the demographics of indie paper. Of course, I would have wrote it. I have to say that. <laughs> uh, but go and read Ellen's article as well, uh, and read her previous article uh, in in Source on looking at the, the the lack of data on EU citizens and the difficulty in in trying to commission that. Uh, I'll link to all three in the description below this podcast. As I say, I think the main lesson here is this is what happens when we don't have an organised campaign and we just allow people to drift in, in and out of independent support because of external events. What we're not doing is finding out how people can be convinced and persuaded and how they can remain persuaded, even despite uh, external events that might try to push them back next time. If we don't do that, if we don't do that, we will not win independence. We will not get to where we want to go. And no amount of fiddling with the franchise and depriving people of human rights will get there. No, the situation we're now in is that it's not sustainable much longer for new Scots who make up a smaller po part of the population of Scotland to sustain the falls that we're encountering on the native Scots side yeah. in support for independence. That is not sustainable. Uh, and so we will see support for independence go down unless we start dealing with these numbers. Yeah, and I humbly suggest that threatening to remove people's uh, voting rights is hardly likely to encourage them to support independence. On that cheery note, <laughs> I'd, I'd... as we come to the end of the podcast, I would like to remind everyone, as I do every week, that Commonweal is entirely funded by folk like yourselves who uh, support the research that we do, like the Demographics of Independence um, paper, either through regular subscriptions, through one-off donations, or by visiting our shop and buying our lovely books and other merchandise. Um, keep an eye on that. We will have exciting news on, on, on new things that are coming into that shop over the next few weeks. Um, so please keep an eye on the website. Signing up, Sign up to our newsletter as well. You'll get uh, a weekly newsletter every Thursday, giving you the, the latest um, activity from Commonweal and uh, analysis and comments from from writers such as myself, such as Ellen, who uh, um, where her article came from last week, uh, and other commentators from around the Scottish political sphere. You can also get a monthly policy analysis from myself at the end of each month. Um, rounding up in some, some detail what's been going on in the po in the policy sphere particularly. So please sign up to our newsletter to, to keep in touch with us and keep in touch with the podcast. Let us know what you would like us to cover in future episodes and come back next week.